So several weeks ago, when I found out I'd be preaching today, I began preparing for the sermon, as I normally do, by just taking a first peek at the scriptures that I'd be preaching on today. And when I read them, I started getting pretty excited. These are excellent passages, I thought. And I even spent the day forming a sermon and my mind discerning the nugget that I wanted to build my message around. Then at the end of the day, I went back and I took another look at the passages, only to find that I had actually read the wrong ones. <laughs> I'd actually looked at the readings from last week, and I'd formed my nugget of a sermon uh, thinking I'd be preaching on those. So I turned to the correct readings, the ones from this week, the ones you just heard, and to be honest, I was way less excited. Uh, because the story of Mary and Joseph and the miraculous conception of Jesus, I've read this passage so many times, as I'm sure many of you have, and I have heard countless sermons about it. And I thought, what new message could I possibly have for you about this passage? Uh, but then it struck me that I was treating perhaps the most extraordinary story that the Bible reveals to us, this news of what N.T. Wright calls God's rescue operation, the arrival of Jesus, the one who will deliver us from sin and begin a new reign of justice and mercy. I'm treating this with an attitude of, meh, I've heard this story before. You might call that a bit of an Advent rut. And I think when it comes to Advent, it can be easy to slip into our old annual ruts, right? We may feel the spirit of Advent when we're sitting in the sanctuary today with the beautiful music and the incense. But then we have to go out there and do the things that we do every year, the getting decorations down from the attic, standing in the line at Costco, whatever it is that you do this time of year. And not that these things are bad at all. God is in our traditions and he's in our celebrations. But if you're just caught up doing all these things that you've always done without any real reflection, or if you find yourself totally absorbed or even wearied by all the material concerns of our lives, then you risk missing the thing, the message that God has for you in Advent, which is about newness and hope and joy. We see this happening today in our reading from Isaiah about King Ahaz. King Ahaz was under attack by two rival kings who wanted to depose him and install a new king. So it's not hard to imagine that the king was terrified. He's terrified uh, that, that there's going to be an attack. He's terrified that there's, there's going to be violence and devastation uh, for his people. So God sends the prophet Isaiah to assure Ahaz of his divine protection. And Isaiah tells Ahaz, you can ask for any sign from God. It can be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven, whatever he needs. But Ahaz refuses. He attributes it to piety that he doesn't want to put God to the test. But whatever the reason, it's wearying to God. Isaiah even tells him, is it too little for you to weary mortals that you weary God also? So God tries to tell Ahaz something, and Ahaz is pushing him away. Isaiah, for his part, thankfully, doesn't take no for an answer, and he gives Ahaz a sign anyway. Isaiah tells King Ahaz about a child who will be born, who will be called Emmanuel, and that within a few years, this child will be eating curds and honey. Now, Curds and honey, if you don't know, are foods that show the future holds prosperity and plenty for the people of Israel, not deprivation and subjugation to a foreign king. In fact, Isaiah tells Ahaz, within a few years, the enemies that Israel is so worried about, now they'll be completely gone. So here we have God delivering a message to Ahaz in the midst of his fear, reassuring him that his enemies will be defeated and his people will be saved. They'll be filled with good things, curds and honey. That sounds delicious. But because Ahaz is so focused on other things, he almost misses the good news of God's salvation. The news of Emmanuel. 
the news that he need not fear because God is with him. I wonder if this is what we can be like in Advent. God comes to us in the distraction or fear or disillusionment of our lives, announcing that we have reason to hope. Like Ahaz, we hear about the coming of this child, Emmanuel, that God is with us. We heard today about the naming of Jesus, that in Jesus, God saves. We too will be delivered from the things that oppress us and feast on curds and honey. But are we so absorbed in our own busyness, or are we weary of waiting for change and have become cynical so that we push God's message away and don't allow it to do its transforming work? To give us hope, fill us with joy. So this is why we need Advent each year, to shake us out of our old ruts and to remind us of the newness of life in Christ. Advent brings us the story, the story of newness and hope. The miraculous conception of Jesus, which we just heard about in our gospel reading today. But rather than just breeze through it because we've heard it before, hearing this story should cause us to stop and wonder. What precisely is it about this story, the conception of Jesus, that's so extraordinary, so life-changing? And the miracle of the conception, Mary was, according to scripture, found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. So here we have God doing something entirely new, something that had never been done before in the course of human history. As Christians, we confess that God assumed human flesh and came to dwell with us in the form of human, truly human and truly divine. In writing about the Incarnation, St. Athanasius considers why God chose to make his appearance in the world as a human and not by some other means. He wonders why Christ did not appear through some more noble parts of creation or use some nobler instrument, such as the sun or moon or stars or fire or air, but merely appeared as a human being. His answer is that Christ came not to be put on display, but to heal and to teach those who were suffering. He writes that one being put on display only needs to appear and dazzle the beholders. But one who heals and teaches is of service to those in need and appears as those who need him can bear. In other words, Christ didn't come with a great showy display of power or force. Unlike earthly kingdoms, he doesn't use fear or coercion or manipulation to get us to submit to his rule. Instead, Jesus came into our chaotic world as a vulnerable baby in order to walk alongside us in our real lives. He came for our sakes not his, in order to heal us and teach us, to transform us by the forgiveness of sins, and to give us new life. He came into the middle of our chaos as pure love. So this week, as I was trying to come up with a picture that would express this idea of love arriving in the midst of chaos, I received an email from of all things, Shutterfly. You know, it's an online, this is an online photo service where you can order prints of your pictures. And periodically they send me an email labeled, your memories from X years ago. You may get these too. But, uh, but it has a bunch of pictures attached uh, to remind me of what was happening X years ago. Probably expecting I'll order more pictures. But. Well, because my daughter's birthday is, this, uh, is in December, I received a picture of us taken on the day she was born, which I hadn't seen for about 16 years. Now, I think we can have a tendency to enshroud the days our children are born with a cloud of idyllic, happy memories. 
But when I think back on that day, the reality was there was a lot of fear and pain. When I went into labor, I started shaking so much I couldn't even speak. I was so afraid. And I remember the hospital, the nurses and doctors coming in and out, and the hospital monitors beeping. Chaos probably sums it up pretty well. But when I looked at this picture of me holding my newborn daughter, all I saw was love. So right in the middle of the fear and pain and chaos, love arrived. How fitting that God came to us in the chaos of childbirth. To a couple whose plans were totally upended by his conception, who couldn't even find a proper place for him to be born. God chose to show up in our chaos, not with the conventional power of the world, but with the vulnerable love and promise of newness that can only be found in a baby. And as we hear the story of his conception each Advent, we are reminded of God's promise that in Jesus, no matter the chaos in our world, no matter the chaos in your life, he is at work all around us making something new. In Advent, we hear God's message that with the coming of Jesus, the old world of conflict, corruption, greed, and ambition was overturned. (laughs) Just like that. The birth of Jesus inaugurated a new kingdom, ruled by love and forgiveness of sin, justice and mercy, and care for our neighbors. And in Advent, we're invited to look up from our old ruts and see the world through this new reality that Christ brings. If you look at the world without seeing it through the lens of Christ, certainly it can appear pretty chaotic. Each day seems to bring new headlines of serious problems and tragedies. Wars, threats to our environments, economic troubles looming on the horizon. Yet as Christians, we are not overcome, and we do not lose hope because Advent reminds us that in Christ, God comes into our chaos with the promise of new heaven, new earth, and new us. And as Christians, we are to live as witnesses, as witnesses to this new reality, as we turn from inward on ourselves to outward, and by our loving actions, offer hope, offer the hope of Christ to others. Walter Brueggemann, in his book, Celebrating Abundance, his wonderful little book of Advent devotionals, which I commend to you if you haven't read it, he writes that the thing, the thing that we prepare for in Advent is that God's rule of starchy justice and generous mercy will arise in the earth, and all that seek to negate abundant life will be overruled and nullified. This is how we pray every time we are together. We pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So today is the fourth Sunday of Advent. It's the last Sunday of Advent. Christmas is just around the corner. But it's not too late. As we prepare our hearts to come to the table together, I invite you to take some time to consider how God, how God might be trying to shake you out of your Advent rut, to cause you to look up and pay attention to him. What messages or pictures might God be sending into your chaos today to remind you of his love? Or how might he be prompting you to bear witness to the reality of his new kingdom by the way that you love others? Let us not be so absorbed with our busyness, our weariness, our fear, or our cynicism that we miss hearing from him. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.